Uh, I'm Barnaby Wainfan. Uh, I'm a long-time EAA or I'm a long-time professional airplane designer. Uh, as of last count, I worked on 27 different airframes that have made it into the air, among other things. And, uh, you know, as you can see, I started relatively young. And I was had an uh, interest in unconventional configurations and ways of doing it better. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is essentially a long study of how to make a better, perhaps even a great personal airplane. So what is all this about? Well, the concept is intended for private pilots. And really what I wanted to do was to create a concept for the way we really fly. And you know, that's not that easy to do. And one of the reasons it's not easy to do is because there's a lot of good airplanes out there. The conventional configuration actually works pretty well. And it's, there's a lot of experience in the design community. It's well developed, lots of, lots of experience. Um, and you know, there's still, I mean, you come out here every year and there's somebody who's gotten a conventional airplane, it's a little better than the one before. But I wanted to look to alternate approaches and see what we could really do. And you know, the key to solving any problem is to understand what the problem you're trying to solve is. So before you start designing something for a given pilot community, let's take a look at what do they really want? What do they really need? You know, there's this great concept in economics called uh, revealed preferences. And what it basically means is what people really want is what they're willing to spend their own money on, not what they tell the focus group they want. And so let's take a look, start by taking a look at, you know, what kind of airplanes do private owners really buy? Well, here's an interesting bit from history. You know, over a 25 year run, Cessna sold over 37,000 172s. In twice that amount of time, Beechcraft sold 3,000 Bonanzas. Now, you know, the Bonanza, it's a great airplane. It's faster than the 172. It's certainly cooler than the 172. If someone was giving me one for free, I know which one I take. But the 172 hit a perfect niche in the market of being within the skills of a relatively new, new pilot, being fast enough, and being something they could afford. And so what the market said is there's 10 times the demand for that than for the really fast cross-country airplane. And I think that's very interesting. Because, you know, what are people normally really doing with personal airplanes? Most of us fly relatively short average flights. There's a, some people who do really use airplanes for transportation, but most of us fly state planes 100, 200 miles, getting a $100 hamburger, flying recreationally for instructions, like some things like that. Uh, a lot of VFR operations, a lot of us are flying out of smallish airports, and we've got a very hot airplane that needs four or 5,000 feet or only to be safe. That eliminates a lot of the airports we're flying at. Um, and cost is important. So what does that mean to a designer about what the airplane has to be? Well, you have to be able to afford it, you have to be able to buy it. It has to be safe. I mean, flying is riskier than sitting in your easy chair, but you only want to go so much riskier than sitting in your easy chair, or at least than driving to work. Um, it has to be safe and operable with modest pilot skills because private pilots are what they are. We'll talk about that a little bit more, a little bit more later, but still. Um, you have to have a comfortable enough cockpit environment that you're not suffering just to squeeze yourself into the airplane. Uh, you know, as we get older, we're not as flexible as we used to be, and we're not contortionists anyway. And actually, a lot of the cockpits are really small. I mean, I remember when I bought my first one, 150, I, uh, I learned in 150s, and many years later, I bought a 150. And the first time I climbed into that airplane with somebody I'd been flying with in a 150, when we were both younger, we both looked at each other and went, man, these things got smaller, didn't they? You know, so it's a tight cockpit. Uh, the performance has to be good enough to do something with it. You know, I mean, ultra lights are fun, but you can't go anywhere. So you need a reasonable cruise speed, but you know, maybe not 300 knots. And the other one you have to have, and I've just recently come to really understand the importance of this, is to have enough useful load. 
And this tends to be a real problem with light airplanes these days. Because if you go back in time, you know, the average Americans are well fed. You know, so if you go back in time, when the airplanes that we now fly, the certified ones, were originally certified, the FAA considered a standard human to be 170 pounds. That was what was written into FAR 23. Well, if you take a look at actual median weights for you know, American men, age 35 to 39, median weight means half are heavier than this and half the lightness. It's 194 pounds. 75th percentile weight is 227. So if I just take two 75th percentile guys and 25 gallons of ab gas, I'm at 604 pounds. That's way beyond the useful order than almost, certainly most of the two seaters we have out there right now. Well, that's interesting. That's a problem. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to belabor this, but we, you know, personal airplanes are bought with personal money. They don't make money for their owners, so you've got to be able to afford them. And what that means, in a sense, is some of the more exotic things you might do um, to make an airplane better aren't affordable to the customer you're buying them. So let's, let's switch, switch gears a little bit and now look at safety. A few quotes to get us in the right, uh, the right mood. This is from RAF pilots during World War II. That when a prying seems inevitable, hit the softest, cheapest object as slowly and gently as possible. And Max Stanley was Northrop's chief test pilot in the first flights of the Northrop Flying Wings said that the Cub is the safest airplane in the world because it can just barely kill you. Okay. But it is important, and you want to design some safety into the airplane. So when I think about that, well, you know, there's the old, the old saw that, you know, takeoffs are optional and landings are mandatory. So once you take off, here's all the things that can happen to end the flight. Now, start in the don't crash category. This is what we all prefer, right? Normal safe arrival at where we were going. Perfect, that's what we wanted, right? Precautionary landing safely at another airport. Still a good day. You can fly home later. Force landing somewhere. That's a pain in the ass. But in the long run, it's okay. The airplane didn't get hurt, we didn't get hurt, we're good. Now, things get progressively worse from here when we get into the crash category. So, you can have a crash where you damage the airplane, but the people walk away. I've experienced this. I will tell you, it did not feel like a good day at the time. But in retrospect, I'm okay with it. I got to go home to my family. Uh, if the occupants are injured but survive, that sucks. You know, like you say, people don't go home. That's unacceptable. And one of the things that's very interesting when you look at all of these outcomes, is all of the acceptable outcomes required of the pilots to maintain control of the airplane until it comes to rest on the ground. The vast majority of fatal accidents happen because at some point in the trajectory, the pilot loses control of the airplane and ends up hitting something hard enough to kill you. So from a designer's viewpoint, this is also very important. So when you look now, this this what a, this is affectionately known by people who've seen this before is the curve of doom. Okay. What this is, is a plot of speed at impact versus the relative angle between the flight path and, and the ground. If you're on this side of the curve, you're dead. If you're on this side of the curve and it doesn't burn, you live through it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're uninjured, but you know, you're in condition for the humans. And what's really interesting about this curve is a couple of things that are really interesting about this curve. The first thing that's striking to me is how slow, in airplane terms, the 100% fatality speed is. It's like 80 knots. Okay? That sounds awful slow for us pilots, right? But 80 knots is what? About 95 miles an hour. So think about being placed in your car with the brakes and the steering disabled and dropped in random terrain at 95 miles an hour. That's what a smooth, tangential to the ground, force landing at 80 knots is. And keep in mind, that's 80 knots when you arrive there, that's not the stall speed of the airplane. Right, because you probably, you know, if your airplane has an 80 knot stall speed, you're probably touching down at about 100. 
And these, these are curves of wing loading for stall speed that give you a rough idea of what wing loading puts you where. The other thing that's interesting about this curve is it shows that a lot of the regulations that we got get given by FAA, I mean, experimental custom built, of course, experimental amateur built doesn't have to abide by them, but some of them actually make sense. And one of the ones in part 23 is a 61 knot power off stall speed for single engine airplanes. Well, if you look at 61 knots, which is about there, well, the impact angle is like 35 degrees. That will only happen if you stall or lose control of the airplane. If you glide into the ground under control at 61 knots, you're down here somewhere. Reasonably survivable. So that regulation really makes sense, at least as a guideline. So what we have here is, if we arrive at an unscheduled arrival at the ground, we want to arrive relatively slowly, under control, and not hit nose first. Which brings us to pilot skills. And the important thing from a designer's viewpoint is private pilots being what they are, and I include myself in that collection, uh, we can't depend on pilot skill to, depend, to, to compensate for bad flying qualities in the airplane. Your average private pilot flies less than 50 hours a year. Most of the time they're flying, they're not doing proficiency flying. They're just out there enjoying themselves. So it's remarkable how many fatal accidents are still loss of control or stall spin accidents. And, you know, higher performance airplanes, you know, conventional blue body tail airplanes that can stall, can spin, require a certain level of proficiency to stay safe. Every airplane does. But from a designer's viewpoint, it's kind of desirable to minimize that. So the ideal airplane should have docile, predictable flying qualities. If you do something dumb, it should buff it and shake and warn you that you're being stupid and not try to jump out from under you. Uh, because the airplane's got to save the pilot because a lot of times the pilot can't save the airplane. And you don't want to put the pilot in a position where they have to. Well, you know, there's a lot of work been done, like I said, on conventional airplanes, making them better. And I think we're reaching something like diminishing returns. Uh, although, technology still helps. You know, uh, over the time, certainly I've been coming to, to EAA, you know, laminar flow and composites have come in. The stall and spin resistance has gotten better with the discontinuous leading edge droop cup, which I actually helped create as a graduate student. I was trying to very early play test of that. Of that. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a true believer in the BRS. I think it's, it's a, a wonderful thing that we now have that plan B in aviation. Uh, but you can only get so far. You know, I mean, safety improvements have done some good. Uh, you know, BRS claims over 250 lives safe now. Definitely stall spin resistance is a good thing, although it's not new. You know, the air coupe dates back to the early 1940s. Uh, and, you know, it hasn't fundamentally changed the picture, although it's definitely progress. Uh, same thing for trying to make conventional airplanes cheaper. Uh, you know, you have things like beaded skins, uh, making the Nandy Trojan, which had ribs on the outside to make them easier to rib it on, and symmetric air so all four skins were the same. And what happened is all of these airplanes that tried this got a little bit of cost improvement, but the cost performance balance didn't get changed enough to really make a big difference. So, you know, there's lots of good airplanes out there, but what about a great airplane? What about something completely different? Because, you know, improving conventional airplanes can only get us so far. So now what? So now, you know, we go to that great program managing group, Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Okay, and uh, by the way here, just I'm not slagging on Randy Schlitter. I think, I, I think the brand's great and I love his airplanes. The reason I put the, the S9 on the chart is that the S9 and the Passivmobile use the same engine. And the Passivmobile is faster than the S9 and lands slower. And the other thing that I love about this concept is if you look at the number of parts of the Passivmobile, about the time I'm finished building my fuselage, I'm ready to go flying, and the guy building the S9 is starting on his wings. So that's one of the things that's very attractive about this approach. But there's more to it than that. Uh, essentially, and this is something that's becoming very much a, 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 
an area of great interest now even in the big aerospace world is what they call multidisciplinary design optimization. The basic idea is rather than considering aerodynamics and structures and weights and propulsion as separate things, you do your analysis with all of them mixed in and see how that affects the, uh, the performance of your airplane. And when you do that, sometimes you find some very interesting things that drive you in a different design direction. And in particular, what I was interested in is the fact that a lot of the things that make an airplane lower drag also make it heavier. And a lot of the things that make the airplane lighter make it higher drag. And guess what? If I have to carry less weight, I can get away with a lower lift to drag ratio and still have the same drag. And isn't that interesting? So, you know, you start down and say, okay, I want to look at an integrated approach. Well, you know, a good engineer runs from history. And, you know, one of my heroes was Jack Morka. And as a matter of fact, when I was in college, when everyone else had a certain pinup on their wall, I had that picture on my wall, you know, which shows you what a nerd I was back then, but, you know. Uh, nonetheless, magnificent airplane. And Jack Morka defined this concept of the all-wing airplane as an airplane in which all of the functions of a satisfactory flying machine are accommodated within the outline of the airport itself. And he considered this like the perfect airplane. And you know, you can generalize that idea to a configuration where everything lifts. You know, the basic idea is everything on the airplane is working for a living. Nothing's just getting dragged through the air. So here's four examples of that. You know, the original Northrop flying wing, I mean you can go everywhere and aspect ratio from here to the X24B and the X-47 be up there in the upper right corner, I am very proud to say I was the lead aero designer on. And just to give you an idea of what you can achieve, that airplane had an aspect ratio of four and a max L of D of order 19. You know, and obviously we've made some great history with that airplane and I'm very proud of it. And interestingly enough, I built the fast mobile and flew it before I designed, did the design work for the X-47 for Northrop. So there's a little bit of EAA even in these high-tech airplanes because we hope to learn here we take to work with us on, on Monday morning. Uh, so in any case, interesting concept. But you know, how do you make it work? Well, we can go back again to Mr. Northrop. Uh, and Jack Northrop in 1947 gave the Wilbur Wright Lecture to the Royal Aeronautical Society, which is an incredibly prestigious thing to be invited to do. And he gave this utterly brilliant lecture about all, all wing airplanes. And one of the things he said was, the airplane must be large enough so the all wing principle can be fully utilized and the dimensions of the average human body may at times be the limiting factor. Now he didn't really care about that much because he was doing intercontinental bombers. But guess what, we care. Because people don't scale, right? A human being who's gonna fly a B-2 is the same size as a human being who's gonna fly a light sport airplane. So when you go back to the principle of entirely within the airflow and pick a reasonable airflow thickness to part ratio, and I use 20%, you can probably push it a little higher than that. You discover that the minimum root cord for an airplane with a single row of humans in it is about 17 and a half feet. It's not an accident, that's about, about how long the fuselage is on a conventional airplane. Well, what does that mean if I start trying to build a flying wing like that? Well, if I take the plan form of the N9M or the YB49, aspect ratio of seven, and take my 17 and a half foot root cord, I end up with an airplane with an 80 foot span and 905 square feet of wing area. That's just a little big for analysis, right? So if I'm trying to preserve this idea of an all lifting configuration, and I keep the root cord constant, and I just start cutting the wing tips off, I end up here. And that puts me in an aspect ratio between 1.5 and 2.5. So now the question obviously is, well, how does that work? It's a nice all lifting thing. Once again, let's go back to some history. Well, actually, the aspect ratio airplanes work pretty well. Uh, I mean, one of my great inspirations was the Dyke Delta. I have a copy at home in my collection of the June 1972 Air Progress with triple five alpha on the cover, which I, you know, I was like 16, 18 years old or something like that, changed my life. 
You know, I looked at that and said, wait, that's too cool. It's 20 years later before I really understood what John Dyke was doing. And then, of course, the Admiral Vulcan is an utterly magnificent airplane. And you can go back in the 1930s in the era. It was a very interesting experiment. And you know, these are not all of them. There's been quite a few. Low aspect ratio airplanes. Uh, I love what David Rowe in, uh, in Australia is doing. He's on like his fourth circular platform airplane. And the useless flying objects. He actually put retracts on his last one just because it looked cooler flying. Uh, but nonetheless, all of these things say, hey, wait a minute. And I remember reading about some of these airplanes, some of the older ones, when I was quite young, and said, these things fly better than the conventional wisdom says they should. What's going on here? This is interesting. And then actually, later on, I found a paper in the Journal of the Royal Aeronautical Society by a gentleman named G.H. Lee, who was a brilliant engineer. And he was looking at, Hanley Page was looking at a flying wing short haul airplane. And they ran into the same problem that when they did what looked like a reasonable aspect ratio, the airplane had to put so much in there, it didn't work very well. And so he said, okay, what if we cut the auto panels off? We did the numbers, and holy, holy cow, it's starting to look good. And then they refined it into this concept, which kind of looks like the Concord is interpreted by buggy planes. And he wrote this really excellent paper, and he bears the citation. And what he found is when you've got this really efficient packaging, the reduction in weight overpowered the slight reduction in the lift to drag ratio, and you actually ended up with a more efficient airplane. And they actually referred to this airplane as an OG, because that's what the plan for is, Aerobus. That airplane is the beginning of Airbus Industries. It never got built, but that, that paper was the beginning of the name for Airbus Industries. So, you know, with all of that in mind, you know, you say, okay, this configuration has some real advantages, possibly, for a personal airplane. Stall and spin resistant, huge center of gravity travel. I love the fact that in fast mobile, I can sit in the seat and put both hands out in either direction and not touch anything. Plenty of room. Uh, so, okay, you've got this marvelous insight. What, what now? Well, there's only one thing left to do. Go do the test. We did. Um, actually, one of the other genesis, and by the way, obviously, you know, if you're an EA, you're going to get better than that. Cover the Rolling Stone, baby. <laughs> you know. uh, but, uh, you know, one of the other genesis of this, I've had these ideas for a long time, and then one Oshkosh here, I was walking down the flight line, and I came up on this most god awful airplane. It was this little biplane. It's kind of dirty, a little ripply in the wings. The canopy literally was flat panels of Lexan held, held together by sheet metal screws. And I'm looking at this thing, you know, thinking uncharitable thoughts. And then I got this light bulb. His airplane is finished flying and on the line at Oshkosh. Where's yours, dude? <laughs> right? Yours is a sketch on a quadruple old pad. Get on with it. So away we went. Uh, you know, because stop talking and start testing, right? And I'm happy to say that we met every one of these objectives, including generating the UFO reports. <laughs> one of my favorite things from early flight tests at, 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 on Facetmobile, and, and I, I was told this secondhand, uh, I was up orbiting Chino Airport in the airplane, and apparently there was a guy, because a friend of mine told me this, he was driving behind me, and I think I'm coming along the airport perimeter road, looking out the window at this thing overhead. And then I turned, and he turned, and the road didn't. <laughs> and, you know, given how many feedlots and dairy farms there are out there, I don't think we enjoy the environment in the ditch very much. And people ask me why it's faceted. And no, it wasn't an invitation to of the F-117, because the F-117 is still classified in time. I didn't know about it. It's just that simple. One of the cool things about this kind of concept is you can make it out of straight pieces, and that in turn means that it's simpler to build. And in today's world, and we're exploiting this now, you can start with stock tubes and cut them on NC machines and have essentially the entire outer bolt line of the airplane without making a single form part. And that's pretty attractive. And the next question is, well, what doesn't the airflow separate over all those sharp corners? Right? Obvious next question to ask. Well, I was fortunate enough to get a wind tunnel test even with the original airplane. 
And so the answer is no, the flow does not detach. This, these are tough. This is a cruise angle of attack. This is a 30 degrees angle of attack. And you can see there's just a little bit of separation starting to happen in, in, in the junction between the fin and the body. And actually on the real airplane, you can, you can hear that. If you try to, try to stall the airplane, and it just marshes. But it buffets a little bit, and it sounds like someone's tapping on the fins. And that's that little bit of separation. So if you get the angles right, you can actually maintain the bad flow. And you think about it, we do that every day on any airplane with a flat throat tail. You know, we look at the airplanes with steel tube tails, like cups and things like that. You never, you routinely think, don't think anything about deflecting your elevator 30 degrees when the flow stays attached. Same hard corner. Turns out there's a threshold beyond which you go in and separates it. The trick is to stay under it. So in 1994, we brought the airplane to Oshkosh. Uh, here it is day one outside the, the Brown Arch. And uh, definitely think we got the dead grass award for that year. This is one day later. Uh, perfect plan from the airplane. By the time we, the airplane left at the end of the show, there was a trench around it about four inches deep just from people pounding the dirt down, which is a pretty cool experience as an EAA, I have to say. And actually, on a personal note, one of the other really wonderful things that happened to me when I brought this airplane here was I had the great privilege of going to University of Michigan and studying under Ed Lesher, who built the TL, which set 11 world records. And his airplane was one of the other ones that inspired me. I went to Michigan, and I got to study with Professor Lesher, and we stayed in touch for the rest of his life. And. Uh, he was at Oshkosh that year. This was his 80th birthday. And you know, he came and he looked, and he got inside the airplane, he looked out, he got out, and he looked at me and said, this is really good, Marty. Man, that meant more than anything. That's the man who taught me. That was like being given my lightsaber and being told I was really a Jedi, you know? Uh, truly a, a wonderful thing. I'm, I'm really glad he lived to see it so I can show him what I had done with all the good stuff that he taught me. You know, because most of what I work on in my professional life is classified, so I don't tell me. Yeah, I'm working on cool stuff I can't show you. So what did we actually achieve with this airplane? Well, it was a far guy with Tex 503, it weighed 370 pounds empty on the ramp, that's my zero fuel weight, and that included the VRS parachutes, which weighed 30 pounds. Okay, we flew it as heavy as 740 pounds, normally it was 620 to 650 with me and fuel. Uh, with the 46 horse Rotex, no wheel pants, it did over 100 knots, it cruised at 80 knots, and my block speed from Chino, California to Oshkosh, and that includes pattern time and everything else, was 77 knots. This is down on 46 horse power. And the other thing that I love about the airplane is you can go to full aft stick, and it will bump it a little bit and just settle at about a thousand feet per minute in a level attitude. It doesn't stall and it doesn't spin. And believe me, the day the engine quit at 600 feet and I had to make it turn back to the airport, I was really happy about that little fact. Now, if I made it three feet higher, I would have been over the fence and the airplane would still be flying. You know, when you see the nose gear leaving formation after the touchdown, it's not ideal. But nonetheless, all of this safety stuff worked really well. You know, I landed slow, I landed upright, I landed under control. If you think about it, you lose the engine at 600 feet, and at the end of the day, you're standing next to your airplane, pissed off because you broke your toy, it's still at the end of the day. So, in any case, you know, count this as a successful experiment, what do we do next? So the next idea was an airplane that we called FMX-5. Um, and the FMX-5, was intended to be a two-seat experimental custom built. This is before the LSA came along. And we got as far as model testing and wind tunnel testing. And I'm going to share a little bit of that wind tunnel data with you just to show you what some of the things that these kind of airplanes do. Um, this is the lift coefficient versus angle of attack here. And you'll notice how flat the lift curve is and how far above the approach angle of attack you can go before you hit maximum lift. Just for perspective, a typical conventional airplane cruises at one or two degrees angle of attack and stalls at 15. And so you're probably approaching it somewhere between 10 and 12 degrees and you've got three or four degrees angle of attack margin to stall. This airplane has 15 to 20 degrees angle of attack margin to max lift. And if you go there, it'll sink, but it won't depart. That's really important. 
The other thing it does, which is really nice, this is pitching moment versus angle of attack, and that way's nose up and that way's nose down, is right around when you get near max lift, there's a strong nose down break. So no matter how hard you pull back on the stick, you can't trim it much above. This is full out stick, much above 25 degrees. So you get natural angle of attack limiting in much the way that the routine can arms do. So all of this means that you have an airplane that intrinsically will protect the pilot from the single biggest loss of control killer accident there is, which is the small stick. That's pretty nice, I like that. Because you know, you go back to the curve of doom and you say, okay, my Cessna, if I stall it out here and lose it, I'm in trouble. And my facet mobile, if I mush into the ground, being just as stupid, I'm a lot slower and a lot flatter and I'll walk away from it. A little later on, back when NASA had a program called PAD, a personal vehicle exploration, uh, I talked to Mark Moore, who was a gentleman in charge of the time, and we got a little study contract uh, from NASA to look at what, what would happen if we did this in composites. And this was a cost-driven thing. Uh, I, I see some familiar faces here. Those of you who have been coming to my talks for years got the full briefing on the results of this study over and over and over again. Well, this year, we're not going to do that. But if you want to, uh, here's the contract number and the citation if you're interested. And also, you can download our final report from, from fastmobile.com. It's out there. So, uh, but in any case, what this study showed is that you can do a light sport trainer using this configuration to get performances as good or better than a conventional airplane while retaining all the other advantages. Well, why? Why does it work? I mean, I'm asserting numbers. I demonstrated that they're the uh, they the fast mobile, but how does that really work? What's the engineering behind it? Because you know, conventional wisdom says that low aspect ratio airplanes are inefficient. Or, you know, people tell you it's a high induced draft. Uh, it's going to be a high draft configuration. Well, I've got an airplane that does 102 knots on 46 horsepower with fixed gear and no wheel pants. Can't be too bad. But why? What's the you know, because it flies in the same air, it's subject to the same physics. So how is that working? Right? Well, it starts out from the idea of transport efficiency. An airplane is fundamentally a tool to take an object from point A to point B. First order, maybe we put aside fires and things like that, right? So what I really care about is not lift to drag ratio, even though I'm an aerodynamicist and I love lift to drag ratio. What I care about is payload to drag ratio. What's the total drag in pounds to move a pound of payload through the air? Or useful load? Fuel, crew, cargo. And you know that's got a lot of ingredients in it. This gets back to that multidisciplinary idea. Weight counts, empty weight counts, aerodynamics counts. And it turns out, and this is the most math of the age you have, guys, so uh, that if you do all the numbers and you derive payload to drag ratio, it turns out to be really simple. It's the payload fraction of the airplane, payload over gross weight, multiplied by the lift to drag ratio. But that's a really interesting number because what it says is you can directly trade empty weight against L over D for the same efficiency. And isn't that interesting when I'm looking at a configuration that's intrinsically very light structural? So now let's kind of dig into the components of this payload to drag ratio as it relates to this. First, this is just statistical data from airplanes, light airplanes. On this axis is aspect ratio. This axis is useful load fraction. These airplanes up here are all the low aspect ratio, all lifting airplanes I can find. Guide Delta 1, Guide Delta 2, my airplane, Arrow few others, right? These are all wing body tail airplanes. And look at the advantage you're getting in useful load fraction by, by taking this small aspect ratio all up in the book. So there's a piece where we're coming out ahead. So now let's address the idea that, yeah, but it's a low lift to drag ratio. Well, what do I really care about with the drag ratio? Well, once again, going into all this, it's interesting is if you go back and really get down deep into it, 
What the drag ratio is only a function of four on four things. Span, span efficiency, weather area, and skin friction coverage. The sentiments are how smooth they're going. Okay? So now you can go back and say, okay, how do those components work with these kind of airplanes? Well, it turns out that blended flying wings configuration has a significantly higher span efficiency than a wing body tail airplane because it doesn't have engines in the wing roof. And it doesn't have a hole in the, in the lift distribution with a fuselage interfering with the wing. So even though it doesn't have as much span, what span it has it uses very effectively. And just to give you an idea, this is a plot of polar plot, drag polar plot from the wind tunnel testing the FMS5 without the tip lights. And it's got a span efficiency of almost 0.9. Typical low wing light airplane is between 0.7 and 0.75. Really good on me to get points. So, once again, not much span, you're being affected. Now, parallel light drag gas has a lot of skin in the air. Not quite as much as you might think, because remember the wind swallows the fuselage. It's still a good depth. But then you get this other phenomenon, you know, parameter called Reynolds number, that's a pump that pretty much governs viscous drag. And the higher the Reynolds number, the lower the skin friction per square foot. Well, when you have a core root cord of 18 feet, instead of 4 feet, the Reynolds number is a lot higher. And once again, this is just a plot of turbulent skin friction. As, as a function of Reynolds number, and you discover you have something like 18 to 20% lower skin friction coefficient, so you're only paying 80% as much for each square foot on the low aspect ratio airplane as you are on the high aspect ratio airplane. So when you add all these things up, what you discover is that the overall drag of the low aspect ratio airplane is really nowhere nearly as bad as you think. Just to give you an idea, uh, we built some UAVs based on the FMX-5, which was an aspect ratio 1.5 vehicle, and they were gliders, the balloon launch gliders, about a quarter scale, so they didn't have the Reynolds number of advantage. And we got trimmed back slip to drag ratios between 8 and 9 at aspect ratio 1 and a half with, with a fast-ended airframe. To put that in perspective, the max L over D of us has a 150 to 10. Okay, so, but you know, once again, the proof is in the testing, right? So let's go back and compare. Tesla 150 versus Fast Mobile, aspect ratio six and a half versus aspect ratio one. Well, the arrow guy is going to tell you that the Fast Mobile sucks, right? Because look, this has got an L over D almost 11, that peaks at a little under over seven, it's worse everywhere. But now you take the payload in. and also the way the curves are shifted. And what you discover is that the fast mobile actually has slightly better transport efficiency than the 150. Now the 150 is hardly a paragon of aerodynamic efficiency. So I mean, you could argue that it's a relatively low bar, but we'll address that in a, in, a, in a little while. But this is the thing, this aspect ratio 1.0 airplane is doing just as well on transport efficiency or even better. And by the way, it's nice and light and it's solves some good resistance kind of listening. So the next step, which is the airplane I am building now, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but I am very happy to say that as of three weeks ago, we made the transition from me telling you guys this is the airplane that I am going to build, because this is the airplane I'm actually building because we cut the first parts three weeks ago. And that's an airplane called the FMX7, and this is the early concept model of it. And the FMX7 was basically starting from FMX5 and saying, hey, I have these new light sport rules that came along since I designed FMX5. Well, what are those rules? I mean, most of you people know them, right? But there's a couple of critical things, and the big one is this max gross weight. Because now I've got a regulatory ceiling to the maximum gross weight. And every pound that isn't in the structure of my airplane is a pound of useful load. And one of the big problems with a lot of LSAs is that they're short on useful load. The other thing about light sport is that they specify a 45 knot stall speed in cruise configuration. 
And that's a big difference than FAR Part 23, because Part 23 specifies a landing configuration. So what it means is for an LSA, you can't build a high wing loading airplane and then use good flaps to drive the stall speed down. Well, low aspect ratio airplane intrinsically has lots of wing area, very low wing loading. Guess what? That drives the stall speed down. So the characteristics of this shape really work well for this, this kind of rule. So, have I said this already? So, in the beginning of that program was to test it with a, with a radio control model. So, this is the model I built of this airplane. It's 18% uh, scale of the four foot span. And, you know, it's amazing how things have advanced since, since I did the original fastable deal. Because this airplane, first of all, is electric, not, not an old glow engine. And we're flying it with a Pixar autopilot in it. So, we have full on data locking. And, man, that helps. Because not only, okay, it flies reasonably well and it didn't scare me too much, but now I've got quantitative data. It's not quite as good as the wind tunnel, but it's, it's really a big step forward. And here's a couple shots of the model in flight, and uh, it flew beautifully. And I want to take a, a brief pause here. Uh, the gentleman who was on the sticks on those two flights is, was Dave Williams. And Dave built the beautiful yellow and black Dyke Delta. That's probably been the poster girl for the Dyke Delta type for a long time. Amazing guy. And sadly, we lost Dave to cancer early this month. Uh, he was one of those amazing people who spoke softly and could do anything. and couldn't do enough to help you. He's a huge loss. And we'll miss him terribly. But I wanted to pay tribute to the help he, you know, what he's done for the whole EAA community and help me personally. And we're going to miss it terribly. In the meantime, uh, on the FMX7 project, I got a chance to work with some very good engineering students in Cal Poly Pomona. And so they did full on CFD model of the thing. And then it was like, gee, could we do a senior project testing your airplane in our wind tunnel? Well, you we have to ask me twice. Right? Because they've got a very nice wind tunnel at. Uh, the Cal Poly Pomona. So here's the model. I'm also very happy to say that the young man who built, designed and built that model, I was able to recruit for Northrop Grumman, and he's now working on the F-35. Uh, and we actually did two tests. So I got roughly 70 hours of runtime in the tunnel on this. So this is probably the best wind tunnel test in home built. If not ever, certainly in my life. And once again, there's the tufts at 9 degrees angle of attack, which would roughly the approach angle of attack. And you can see the air is pretty happy. It's starting to form a vortex at the leading edge, which will often lift the lift the airplane. And the other neat, neat thing I tested in, in, the, in the wind tunnel, I'm actually going to incorporate into the, into the build airplane, is a different tail configuration. You know, because the model we flew with the, the twin verticals. And I was thinking, gee, you know, if I can't them in, they'll brace and touch them, they'll brace each other. And, and then I can use rudder toe angle as a pitch trimmer. And that actually looks like it's going to work very well. So that's going to be a problem that we're going to work on. Once again, back in the lifted pitching moment, like I showed you for the next five years for the next seven. So once again, very flat top lift curve. The tunnel would only go out to 38 degrees, so we couldn't find the stall. Because you can see, the lift is almost constant. The other thing to note here, this is with pullback stick, but you can see that the FMX7 has a seal max of a little over one, which is about 20% better than the FMX5. So I actually did learn something in 20 years. I'm kind of happy about that. And here's a pitching moment curve, it's the same thing. It's nice and stable. General break at 15 degrees, hard break at 25 degrees. If you think about that, that's pretty good. 15 degrees is about the touchdown angle. 10-ish, 8 to 10 is approach. Cruises, two minutes. So I'm going to get into now some performance calcs for the FMX7 comparison to other airplanes. And uh, you know, before we get into that, though, I want to tell you what the basis of these numbers that I'm about to quote are. Um, from weight estimations, I, I use actual, and we're going to talk about that a lot. I use actual weights from the original Fastmobile, 
correlation with other low aspect ratio airplanes. And I was able eventually also to get good weight data on the dike delta and do back increments from the dike delta. For aerodynamics, of course, we had a lot. We had 130 hours of flying a fastmobile, so we had a pretty good idea what the drag characters of the fastmobile were. And then from the wind tunnel test, I have span efficiency in the drag polar shape. And so those were what went into this analysis. So first thing to look at is, is the weights. And uh, I did weight estimates a whole bunch of different ways, from the parametric to increments off the deck delta, increments off the facet mobile, to bottom off, fabric covered, and with aluminum, aluminum uh, sheeting covered. The heaviest number I got was just over 700 pounds, and that's for the full aluminum skin, which I'm not going to do. But the fabric airplane, the lightest number I got was 516, and the heaviest number I got was 649. If I can make it somewhere in that range, I'm going to get very happy there. So for the numbers that I'm going to quote from you going forward, I took the heaviest anyway that's what I had. And I actually have the one pound that looks around number at 650. But look at what that does to my useful load of your life sport. If I hit my heaviest empty weight estimate, I've got 670 pounds of useful load. To be it somewhere in the mid-range, it's over 700. And so if you look at how that compares to, and once again, these are the two airplanes I use as comparison with the NASA report, so we'll get to the LSA comparison in a little while. But if you take a look at like the Diamond DA-20, which is in a sense the modern composite, aerodynamically efficient airplane. It's the airplane that the aero guy would design to replace the one big. Right? Well, if you look at it, look at how much heavier it is. Over 760, 760 pounds. It's got about 580 useful load. The FMX7 at 1320 light sport illegal is going to have six, over slow over 600. Okay, well, once again, let's get into efficiencies. But here's the interesting thing. It's really striking when you look at the weight breakdowns. These are just stacked bar charts. If you look at the FMX7, that's empty weight, the green is useful load. And I may actually break the useful load fraction 50% on this airplane. If you go to the diamond, I'm using all of this mass to carry that mass. And so what's happening is that it's a very aerodynamically efficient airplane that's efficiently carrying its own empty weight from here to there and allowing a little extra load to piggyback on it. But once again, let's get down to the, the real details. So here's a comparison of lift to drag ratio for the three, the three types. And once again, you know, we're in 2021 now, so that part, I mean, 152 is an ancient obsolete airplane. You're setting a low bar comparing with that. Compared to a modern efficient airplane. Okay, let's do that. Well, guess what? The air guy looks again and says, you got it wrong, dude. Higher L over D all the way. But now, when we make it, take a look at each of those airplanes flown at its max gross weight, and look at how much gross power it actually takes to make them fly, which is, of course, what determines fuel burn, right? Look at this. The curves for the FMX7 and the DA20 are almost on top of each other. It's within the noise band of what I can calculate. But because I'm not carrying around that extra 300 plus pounds, and because the low aspect ratio airplane gets its max L over D at a higher airspeed than the high aspect ratio airplane, out here where I'm cruising, where I care, the fuel burns pretty much identical. You know, by the way, I'm carrying about 90 pounds more useful load. And of course, I'm flying at the same useful load. The FMX7 curve is going to move down because I took the weight out. And think about it from a tooling and a cost to build point of view compared to molds and all the tooling you need to build a DA20 to putting aluminum tube and sheet on, a, on an NC machine. So once again, this is a similar chart to the one I showed about the, the uh, 150 versus basketball build. But what's interesting here now is that because of the higher useful load of the FMX7, it's actually got a better transport efficiency 
be a giant over the entire army. And now let's look at performance. I mean, fine. Transport efficiency is a nice abstract number that makes the engineers and the nerds happy. But what do I care about? I'm going to get in this airplane and go fly. Okay, what do I care about? Well, how about way to climb? I can't care about speed in an LSA because the government says I can't go faster than 120 knots. And of course, we'll all claim that my LSA will never go faster than 120 knots, trust me. Okay? Uh, well, how about we have climb? This is where the power to weight and, and the lowering will really help you. So, it looks like with 120 horsepower, the F-7 is going to climb close to 1,600 feet a minute on the sea level standard weight as opposed to about 900 for the uh, diamond. And the book says a 150 will climb at 700 feet a minute. I've got 400 hours in them. I've owned two of them. And I have never seen 700 feet per minute except in one hell of a thermal. <laughs> but, you know, we'll take what the calculations show. And uh, I see a few games starting to move. I'll take questions at the end. <laughs> um, so now let's look at take up distance. Look at it now with our low aspect ratio airplane. It's got a much higher power to weight than our conventional airplane because even though it's got the same horsepower, it's lighter. It's also got a very low wing loading, which means it lifts off relatively slow. So what it means is if a 150, an FMX7, and a Diamond start down the runway, the FMX7 will be crossing 50 feet about the time the 150 driver is rotating and the diamond driver has got another 300 feet to go after the 150 before they get to rotate the nose out. Because this is where the, the gross weight really hurts you is acceleration, power to weight. The low wing loading also helps on, on the way back because even though the CL max is relatively low on the low aspect ratio of airplane, it's quite a low wing loading, about five pounds per square foot. And so, Right now, I'm calculating a 38 knot minimum speed for every mix 7 echoes. So, you know, comfortably under the 45 required, which by the 1.3 stall standard for approach speed means it approaches at about 50 knots. So, nice, quick, quick takeoff, nice, slow landing. And here's a, just a quickie comparison with uh, a couple of actual uh, LSAs. Uh, and one of the things, by the way, this tells you is why one of the reasons why the Cessna Skycatcher was a failure in the marketplace. The prime little airplane apparently flies very well, but it's only got 490 pounds of useful load. Well, and then from a training operation and my instructors aren't really little, and I take full-size students, at best I can put an hour's fuel, which means at best I have to refuel the airplane after every every training flight and I have to get very close attention to how much gas I'm putting in. And how do you do a supervised cross country in a country for $30 a And you know flight design with the CTLS has actually done pretty well. I mean they're up to 550 pounds which for a conventional and good detail airplane is really good. It's a nice little airplane. Uh, you can see the difference in rate of climb, and this once again, this is the light weight and the power weight ratio really paying off. And the other thing that I love, of course, is cabin size and baggage compartment, right? I mean, uh, you know, that 43 inch wide cabin, which was roughly what a 150 was, 44 inches, that's tight, that's uncomfortable. When I go flying with my daughter in the, in the 150, it's like, it's a good thing we love each other. Uh, once again, these guys figured that out. They made it a lot wider. Center section of FMX7 is seven feet wide. <laughs> There's gonna be plenty of room in there. Uh, and then once again, you have room behind the, the seats for a very large baggage compartment. And granted, you can't put thousands of pounds in there, but you can sleep in there. <laughs> Bring flashcards, right? You don't know, bring a tent, you just put a sleeping bag in back here, like, and you can put bulk in there. So that's kind of good. I've already quoted these numbers to you. So um, on the FMX7 build, you know, using what is now a wonderfully member benefit SOLIDWORKS, so there's the 
SOLIDWORKS model of the entire structure. There's a few more tubes been added since then, but this is pretty much what the structural layout looks like. And uh, that brings us up to an update on what's happening overall on various fastable gill related projects. Uh, in March of this year, I moved from the Los Angeles area Here we are in the 292 hangar, and lurking in the background is the replica facile bill, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment, which Bob Eagle is building. But that right there are the very first pieces of the FMX7. This picture was taken last week. So the first pieces have come off the machine. They clego up beautifully. This is the front portion of the left, the low left outer panel. It's from the back to the to the aft main sparse extension structural box. We've Literally completed the first fit up two days before I left for AirVenture. As soon as I get back, we're going to cut the pieces for the right one and start driving the river. So it's underway. It's actually finally really happening. Um, in the meantime, there have been other fastable mobile related things going on. And one of them is, is a UAV. Uh, I'm working with a little startup company called Theircraft. And Theircraft, we're using low aspect ratio lifting body type of concept for a UAV to do precision delivery of cargo. And these airplanes are also made out of NC cut flat stock. And uh, here's a couple of them. And you can see the platform's a little different. It's slightly less low aspect ratio than the fast mobile. It's about 1.2. But once again, we've got a three-foot airplane it will carry two to three pounds of deliverable payload with a reasonable range. And the other little party trick we have with this is we've developed a payload-based system that also acts like a split flap. It's almost like a VHS cassette. And so the way we're doing things is make a super low approach, get slow, open the hatch, payload falls out on the ground, the lift pulse kicks the airplane up away, and uh, this is the airplane right after that drop I showed you the picture of. And that was our target. And just to give you an idea of the precision, that airplane's three feet long. So right now in our chest, we're consistently hitting a 10-foot diameter circle. And so we can, we can pop a payload into a 10-foot diameter circle from an altitude of about two feet at about 20 knots. Still not used for delivering OIX or for almost anything else. You know, I can deliver a payload, we can deliver a payload without hovering. There's a lot of interesting applications for that, and that's ongoing. And then, you know, uh, you've seen this picture before. This is Bob Engel with the structure of the replica FMX4 Fastable building. He's building in Independence. Uh, you know, like a lot of us, Bob sheltered in place for a long time when, when the pandemic hit. I'm happy to say he's back to work. And this is the state of the airplane as of about a week ago. Systems are in, the engine works, it's covered, it needs paint, cowling, and maybe a few other, other bits, windows, and uh, hopefully within a month or two it will be in taxi test. The biggest time it should fly by the end of the year. But there's a lot happening in this world with the people's concept here. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of work has gone into this. I think this combination of the low aspect ratio configuration and automatic uh, automated manufacturing will be quite revolutionary. We can build an airplane that does more of what we need to do that is safer, that's easier to build, and fundamentally, I think it's going to be a great personal airplane. I can't wait to get FMX7 finished and flying so we can really prove it. Uh, and with that, Thank you very much for your attention, and let's open up questions. Uh, does this set of wing have a higher critical angle of attack than a rectangular wing? Does it have a higher critical angle of attack? What do you mean by critical angle of attack? When it stalls. Well, 
it's more than 38 degrees, we know that. Can you explain also what you meant about the leading edge vortex enhancing the lift? Okay, uh, let me run over. Uh, okay, I'll wave at the screen as best as I can. You ever see, like in F-16 or an F-18, you make a uh, pass when there's a lot of vapor and you see the vortex? Okay. When a vortex spins up, the center of the vortex basically pulls the air out and you get very low pressure in the core of the vortex. So if you can spin a vortex up from the leading edge that's over the top of the wing, that whole low pressure zone gets trapped on top of the wing and generates lift. It's draggy lift, but it's a lot of lift. So for slow flight, it's very good. You wouldn't want vortex lifting first. But what's cool about these shapes is they transition seamlessly from basically classical attached flow, airflow style lifting to vortex lift as you increase angle of attack. And when you get the shape right, you can't move it free. You can hear it happening. You can't feel much difference in the way you're going that. As far as rectangular versus delta, you know, the, the strength of the vortex is very much a function of how you sweep the leading edges and the leading edge geometry. But to put it in perspective, I look at the wing on like an RV, something, you know, that's the ratio of six or seven straight wing. It's going to stall at around 15 degrees angle of attack, 15 to 18. That'll go out to 38 degrees, and I don't know where the maximum is, but it's higher than that. Now, I'm never going to deliberately fly it to 38 degrees angle of attack, and in fact, the other ones don't have enough control power to trim it to 38 degrees angle of attack. So what it says is, I've got plenty of stall margin from wherever I could possibly trim the airplane. And that's one of the things that I find very attractive about the concept. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think that there is advantages to applying the low aspect ratio to conventional aircraft? Do I think that there are advantages to fly, applying the low aspect ratio to conventional aircraft? Not really. Because the real problem is, if I simply take an airplane and put a low aspect ratio wing on it, I'm giving away most of the weight benefit. Because I've still got the fuselage. My wing may be a little lighter. And I still also don't have the advantage of the high span efficiency and the elimination of the, of the interference drag. There was one lowish aspect ratio of conventional airplane that actually worked pretty well. And it was a push plane called the Fight Model E. And it was a high wing airplane with an aspect ratio of about three. But you will not get as much benefit as if you go a whole high. Because there's an awful lot of the benefit that comes from this configuration is when you let the wing swallow the fuselage. And so you're getting, just like you're getting the aerodynamic pieces of doing double duty, the structural pieces are doing double duty also. You mentioned the use of x plane in the flight of FMX4. How much utility do you think? Well, wait a minute. I, I, you say I mentioned the use of x plane in, 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 the, in the design of FMX4. I absolutely did not. Oh, did I misunderstand? Why? Yes, sir. Uh, I did not use X-Plane at all in the design of FMX4, if for no other reason than X-Plane was 20 years in the future when I designed FMX4. <laughs> okay. Uh, but X-Plane and X-Plane-like simulators are of some use, but they can lead you down the garden path. And the real reason for that is that the aero models within them, the, aero, the physics that the aero modules calculate is somewhat limited. So it's pretty good for cruise attached flow. It doesn't predict vortex flows. It doesn't predict stall. So for example, I, I did an ultralight for myself, and I built an X-plane model of that. I didn't necessarily use it to design the airplane with it. And it actually flew, and I, I flew the X-plane model before I flew the real airplane. And they were close enough to say, yeah, I can see those as roughly represented. And I know of other companies that have used X-Plane but hacked it so they put their own aero models in. Because the physics model, the basic six degree of freedom physics model in it is great. And the graphics is great. So if you can get the data to put your own aero model in, it's a, it's a really good simulation platform. But what's in there itself, you can do some preliminary design stuff. And certainly for conventional airplane, you can do a good bit. When you get out on the edge like what I'm doing, and by the way, there's half a dozen Fastmobile uh, X-Plane models out there from, from hobbyists. You know, and have fun, but don't expect it to tell you what the airplane really does. So, so you, you used the jabber mentioned there. Do you have any particular reason, or tax, anything else? Okay, uh, a little bit of history. 
The original fastable bill had a Rotex file of V2 stroke. Okay? The failure of that engine is the reason why that airplane is not flying anymore. Okay. So, lesson one learned. Two strokes are great for all two lights. I'm not flying cross country with them ever again. Uh, so, decision was, I'm going to put a real airplane engine. So, the primary candidates I was looking at were the Continental 0200 and the Lycoming 0235. We got lots of time behind them. Um, I've flown more tests, four stroke powered airplanes. I've got nothing against the engine, it just doesn't particularly appeal to me. And then somebody I know threatened to give me a Jabber 3300. And I looked at the numbers on it and said, I like that. It's lighter, it's got horsepower. And assuming this individual actually does give me the engine, although heard a little bump bumbling that it, it might have another mission before I come for it, uh, the price is right. So that, that's what I'm baseline. You know, right now we're going to get up under the blank firewall. If a year or two from now when it's time to say, okay, what engine are we hanging on this thing? I will see what's available, what the price is. But it's in that 100 to 125 horse range and four stroke real airplane engine and I'm only going to use an engine with a good bit of history. You know, there's some engines under development which look very attractive. But I'm developing a rapid aircraft configuration. I'm going to try to keep everything else as straight down the center, conventional practices I can, and I'll take any risk. So that's where that's at. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I suggested, I, I did more than suggest, I flat out stated it. Uh, it has a you know, a 20% uh, better lift coefficient. I've learned a lot about shaping over the years. And if you look at the shaping on the 7, the corners are a little more subtle. It's got a little more leading inch camber. The sweep angles are a little different. And all of that just delays the initial break in the curve by a few degrees. So that's where it comes from. It's a whole lot of nuance though to me. Uh, let's see, anyone else got a first question? I'll Yes, sir. I'll come back to you for your second. In the wireframe picture you yes. showed, not only did it look symmetrical, but it looked like uh, your uh, max thickness was about halfway through your cross section, symmetrically, front to back. Is that just the appearance well, of the wireframe? Yeah, it's the appearance of the wireframe. Just to put it in perspective, the Basic hull is 18 feet long. The other ones have a foot and a quarter to that. The peak of the canopy is uh, roughly seven feet after the nose. So, and it's definitely not symmetric top to bottom. It's not a symmetric or for a row. It's flat bottom, and it has a curved uh, or multifaceted inside view. You can see it up sweep here. But there's a lot more arch the top and the bottom. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons why it has the higher max lift. It's got a little more camber than, than the, the five did. Alright, yes sir? Yes. Well, yes and no. Okay. Fundamentally, in order to make a flying wing work, the wing has to do all the functions of the wing and the tail. And so you end up with some way of putting a little bit of download on the trailing edge to trim the airplane. So if I'm going to do a plank flying wing, I do that with a reflex airplane. If I'm going to do something where I can have twist, like a swept wing, the north flying wings actually weren't reflex, they were symmetric. But they had wash out. And if I sweep and wash out, and if you look at this picture, this front picture, you can see that there's a good bit of washout in this wing just from the way the volume develops. So what I'm using on here is a combination of three things. Sweep and wash out, uh, a little bit of trim on the elevons, and then on the version I'm actually building, the inverted detail has a little bit of incidence in it to take a little bit of the trim load also. So it's a little bit of all of that. You know, is it a lot of design pre-screening. So, uh, do you show the charts for uh, the performance? Yes. I was curious whether that was at max gross weight or that was at like, what weight 
Oh yeah, every airplane, all of the data for all of the airplanes was at Max Gross. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I am happy to say that with great effort, I now weigh less than a 50th percentile American male. And so with me alone and a couple hours of fuel, it should climb really, really well. But you know, one of the things I, I take seriously um, is if I'm gonna build a two-place airplane, I wanna build a two-place airplane, but right two real humans in the airplane still operate it. You know, and yeah, I can find bigger humans. You can overgross any airplane. Uh, years ago, I was working with, with uh, a kid airplane company that on a pusher airplane, I won't name names here, but, and we got a, uh, a customer calling and complaining that it was running out of elevator uh, on, on a final approach. And remember, this is a pusher, so it's side by side, two place, both people are ahead of the CG. And, you know, we've never had any problems, so we asked him, well, you know, how much weight did you have in the airplane? He said, well, I'm not really sure. He said, but I weigh about 285 and Billy Bob's a big boy. <laughs> you know, so we had designed the airplane for 200 pound passengers. 400 pounds. As near as you can tell, he had about 650 pounds in the cockpit. So he's 200 pounds over the gross, way outside the front of the CG. We were just happy the airplane flew well enough for him to be complaining about elevators. But yeah, I mean, I'm quite serious about, uh, you know, got to be able to pull slice human in every seat. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna play games of comparing rates of climb and gaining the weights. Would be useful load. Okay, you next. Yeah. Would be useful load so large if you considered making it electric. It would be useful load so large if we considered making it electric. Not really. Uh, I think it might be fun. Somebody, you know, somebody wants to play. Great. But you know, electric is a new thing that's coming along. The jury's still out on where it's going. And once again, one experiment at a time. You know, I mean, it may be that I fly this airplane and it flies beautifully and with my camera engine, and I say, well, you know, this would make a great single seat electric airplane because I'll take the other 400 pounds and put enough batteries to get somewhere. But that's not my experiment, that's not what I'm chasing right now. Okay, this gentleman in the back has been raising his hand patiently. How well does it fly turbulence and crossings? Okay, how well does it fly turbulence and crossings? Very good question. Because, you know, the first thing you look at, passable, you know, three pounds per square foot, you can get kicked around. But one of the interesting things about low aspect ratio airplanes is the slope of the lift curve is much flatter than a higher aspect ratio airplane. And what that means is that for a given angle of attack change, it makes less lift change. And that means for a given gust velocity, which is a given angle of attack change, you get less lift change. So the way I would put it is flying the original fastmobile around, and I flew it for over 100, 130 hours. The overall comfort level in turbulence was about like being in my 150. The motion is different because it doesn't heat very much and it doesn't roll very much, you know, because a lot of the motion you get in turbulence is sticking a wing tip. In a, in a thermal, well, when you don't have any tips, that doesn't happen. Uh, so it had one slightly odd characteristic that was very directionally stable, and that is if it got hit by a cyclist, it would just yaw. And the first time I did it, it freaked me out because the airplane just suddenly the nose came and went zoop, and it came right back. So you know, after I realized that that's just what it does, it's very stable. So you know, it's not you know, airliner rock solid, but it, it's right in the, in the ballpark of what you'd expect in a light airplane. Crosswinds, once again, it does better than you think because with that shape, it doesn't make much side force. You side slip, but the drag doesn't change that much. So you have to work at it, but the elephants are really effective. And so just to put it in perspective, we're fast it will be able, I landed it on the way to Oshkosh in 12 knots dead cross. You know, I remember three pounds of stuff with the airplane. It's a little sporty. I had to work at it, but it wasn't like I felt like I was like on the ragged edge. So if I was setting, you know, a crosswind limit, I'd probably choose about 15 miles. Crosswind component. 
So once again, so much in the band of well, a normal layer of thing to do. Uh, we're getting to the end of time here. Is the next speaker here? Okay, if there's nobody here who wants it, I'll talk as long as you guys want to. Now, let's, get, let's get the gentleman behind you back. I'll get you next. Yes, sir. I understand the idea of uh, not changing the design without your design's group, but yes. I've got a million sonics in there. I'm told by the design that it's really stable, and that's the way it might be. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. You and I can talk about that okay. in private. Okay. That's not the subject of this talk. Okay. It's kind of building on the earlier question. Yes. Yes. Okay, how does it fly? It's actually a very friendly airplane. Um, you know, Peter Lerner is a very well-known guy and an amazing pilot. He put the first two flights on passing the for me. And then he got very busy. And I, I said, well, I'd like to take over the test program. And I asked him, Peter, is it going to be OK? And, you know, can I handle this? And he said, OK, it'll be fine. It doesn't do anything too weird. And what it does, it does slowly. Okay. But more directly, it's pretty stable on all three axes once I got everything set. I mean, when I was flying to Oshkosh, I could mostly put my hand off the stick and shoot the rudders to keep it low. Um, the controls are not super light, but they're very crisp. There's no dead man. So control forces, let's say both forces, about like a Cicabria, but it'll roll 180 degrees a second if you're willing to put some muscle into the stick. So overall, it's a very fun airplane to fly because when you're just cruising, it doesn't require much work. If you want to play, it'll play. It's not twitchy. And you know, the way I look at it also, when I started flying this airplane, I was a 200 hour session on 50 driver. And it never once did we feel like I was, it was passing my skill. It was a lot more fun to fly, you know, but fundamentally, you know, it's a relatively good friend of The one thing you have to get used to, it's got a pitch trim change in ground effect. It noses up as you go into ground effect, it noses down as you come out. So when you take off, and rotate and lift off as you climb through about 10 or 15 feet. If you hold constant back pressure, the airplane will just gently level off and hold that altitude. So you have to pull another three or four pounds to hold, hold the attitude or hold airspeed. So basically you lift off and you retrim after you go through that. Coming back down, that's wonderful because the airplane flares itself. You just trim for approach speed, hold a nice steady attitude, and you can feel it switching the ground effect and flare, just a little bit. Hardly takes anything to land it, which is wonderful. Till the day you have to go get a biennial flight review at a 172 after having flown this airplane continuously. And you have to remember, as you're making a 30 degree flap approach, to actually flare. But yeah, it's a pretty friendly airplane to fly. Uh, you haven't asked the first question yet. I'll, I'll get back to you. Oh, the door is conventional. Uh, let's see. The short answer is yes and no. Uh, I am going to see. Okay. I have this chart in there just in case someone asks. Um, I am going to have floor hatches, just like the FMX4. But I know you need top side doors too. And the problem is, the, the real concern is it's on the top of the airplanes. There's a lot of suction on it. It's basically the top of the wing. So at the moment, this is the idea is that I'm going to have hatch sized doors on the top side. You know, I'm going to reinforce the wing walk area right here. And probably use a rope ladder. This is a single biggest problem with these low cost preparation airplanes. You walk up to the edge of the airplane and you're six or seven feet from the seats in every direction. So I am going to have those on there. Whether I will simply use them to ventilate the cabin or get an out get in and out, I don't know. But yeah, that's one of the biggest issues. Because a bigger canopy, like the like Delta's have, the latch system you have to have to make sure it stays closed in flight is a serious deal. Because, you know, you lose that canopy in flight, you're going down. And that's why I'm only using the small doors, because if I lose that small door, I'll be fine. You know, but if I were to open a big chunk of this canopy, you think about it, I just blew a huge hole in my wing and exposed the back of the cabin as a, as a spoiler. 
I don't want to do that. So that's an ongoing. Okay, let's see. You had a question, and I'll get to you. Why did you put two vertical stabilizers and rudders on it instead of one? Why did I put two vertical stabilizers on instead of one? Partially because of structural integration with those outer ribs. Partially, frankly, because it looks cool. <laughs> and as it evolved to the inverted detail, that actually gives me some advantages that I would preserve anyway. But part of the idea was by splitting the two vertical fins, less bend, more on the fins, the fins are lighter. And originally I was going to set it up with out only rudders like a long easy, which makes the whole uh, rudder pedal system simpler. I gave that up with the inverted detail because I like the trim. I guess. Uh, people have built passable build models with single verticals, and it does work. And, you know, we can have a very reasoned argument about whether it's a better idea, and I'm not sure I can absolutely convince you otherwise, but I made my decision for what I wanted. Well, let's see. Nice. Uh, what are the genes that suggest that aerobatic potential? What, what are the G limits? The original Fastmobile was designed to 10 G's ultimate, so divide by 1.5. This one I'm designing to 6 G limit load. Uh, as far as aerobatic potential, it's not designed as an aerobatic airplane. Uh, is it likely you could roll it safely? Yeah. You could you loop it safely? Probably. That's not what I'm building it for. I'm not putting inverted fuel or oil in it. Uh, I mean, if you want to just go bank and yank, yeah, it's a blast. But it's not primarily intended to be like it. Say again, I'm sorry, you have to say it all over again. Is the self-flaring aspect of the wing, is that unique to a delta wing, a flying wing, or uh, I think it's very configuration specific. Uh, I know, for example, that they have a similar characteristic on the V2. And we saw some interesting things on X-47 also. But it's very dependent on the shape of the bottom of the airplane and what the shape of the channel between the airplane and the ground is when you get close to the ground. How about like the F-102, F-106? Uh, don't know. Like I said, very configuration specific. Yes, sir. Is there any thoughts about scaling it down to Is there any thoughts about scaling it down to Volkswagen? The short answer is that there was a lot of people other than myself who have thought about that a lot, but it's not a good idea. I mean, you could do a low aspect ratio ultra, but remember that uh, the wing loading you would need for a part 103 is even lower, and the real problem is it wants to fly faster than that. So yeah, I mean, I think you could probably do a amusing 103 airplane, but. You know, who knows? Okay, we are over time, so I want to make real sure that the next speaker isn't sitting here being annoyed that I'm stepping on his time. Apparently not. Okay. Anthony? The V tails, are they actual rudders or just trim tabs? And is it okay, like. Okay, the V tails, well, I mean, you know, it's all detail. The devil's in the V tails. <laughs> uh, but the short answer is they will be rudders. And then there will be a mixture to put bias in for pitch trim. Will they be like Leon Davis's uh, rudderbaders inverted? Oh no, they're not. They're, well, they're not going to be rudderbaders. It's going to be fixed with with the with, with more like more like an upside down bonanza tail. Will the high mo, high distance actually give you the pitch down you need for rotating? Oh I, well, understand that's. I'm going to use it primarily for pitch trim and flight, like the trim tail. But not pitch trim and landing. No, I mean, it, it's going to have elevons, so the primary pitch control is still elevons. The inverted detail is just going to be for pitch trim. The original Fastmobile, you know, the, the, center flat, the center surface on the original airplane, because uh, I was wondering if you were dovetailing out what John did with the small flying tail. Yeah, it's essentially the same concept that Dyke is doing uh, with the T-tail. Same basic idea is that if you put the pitch trim somewhere off of the, uh, the main wing, 
off of the off of the main wing. You know, an elevon deflected up to make the airplane uh, trim is a reverse is an inverted flap. It's actually taking lift off the wing. So if you can take some of that trim function off, that's one of the reasons I'll have a higher trim max lift on the seven. Uh, but it's not the primary pitch control of the airplane. Thank you. So, yeah. Will I share my, the math of the presentation? Okay, if you go on fastmobile.com and download the NASA report, all of that is in there in great detail. Greater detail than I put here. Yeah. Well, for operations, where? Well, it's landing gear design problem, pretty much. I mean, uh, I wouldn't have taken the original fastmobile into an unimproved strip because it had a tiny little nose gear, you know. So I mean, if you're willing to eat the weight and the drag of a gear that can handle getting bounced around, then yeah, there's no reason why I shouldn't do it. That's not what I'm doing. I mean, I'm designing a, a runway to runway or planning to put a robust enough landing gear on it that I could land on a nicely tailored grass field. But uh, you know, it's not a, a gear to go bush flying with. Just because it's a fixed gear airplane, I don't want to drag those big thunder tires in the air all the time. Um, do you get any handling qualities that come from what I'm assuming is a lower roll moment inversion? Oh, handling qualities are from a lower roll moment inversion? Sort of. It feels agile in roll. Okay, and then roll 180 degrees a second, it feels nice and nicely connected. It's not a lot of perceptible control lag. You know, so to the that extent that some of that comes from the wall and inertia problem and stuff, you know, you don't get the feeling that there's a long build up of roll rate. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the natural period of the Dutch roll is, well, the Dutch roll is almost all you all, but it's relatively rapid, the Dutch roll natural period, which is close to wall inertia. And the damping is almost dead beat. Cruise, you put a yard up and you close the lane on one side. But yeah, it does have a nice little. The thing is, it also has a good bit of old damage in that area out there. So it's an interesting mix. Alright, looks so like anyone else or are we exhausted each other? No? Okay. How badly damaged was the original Fast How badly damaged was the original Fast Mobile? Just badly enough, unfortunately, is the best way to put it. Actually, it was pretty badly damaged because what happened is I hit the fence, we yanked the nose gear out of it, which buckled the firewall, and then the next wire down yanked on the main gear, which didn't rip it out, but yanked it just enough to buckle the main launch runs as it was attached to. So basically, when we started to try to restore the airplane, we tore it all the way down, take care of the and for a whole bunch of reasons, people not doing program maintenance and doing people doing bad work, uh, all of the various things that happened in just living life. The project lost momentum. And um, about 10 years ago, we started to pick it back up. And what it ended up with is what it would cost them time and money to finish it wasn't prudent at that particular instant in our lives. And a few years later, I'm now able to do this on my own. And I concluded, somewhat sadly, that the original fastball drill has done its job for me. It was the next point to prove everything you needed to prove. I mean, when I flew it here, I tell you, there's no feeling that I'm getting your original design on that runway. You know, and I remember saying at the time that I got it here to Oshkosh, that if it never flew again, it would have been worth it to be put into it, and I stand by that. Uh, but putting that, those resources into getting the FMX7 built is a much better expenditure of those resources. Now, the remains are preserved. I have to cut it up. So if some combination of the right people, the right money, the right stuff comes along to restore it, I'm not against it. But it's not a high priority for me because, you know, I love that airplane. But I also realized it was a step on a path, 
and the path is to what the FMX7 is supposed to be. And I'm not as young as I used to be either. I've got time, the fate is kind, taking good care of myself to build and test the FMX7, but not to restore FMX4 and then make more money and then do the FMX7. So, Bike Model E, F-I-K-E, Model E. Is that the, the one that's being built uh, with placement of the uh, building? Yes. Is that just going to be somebody's personal area? Yes, or, yeah. Uh, it's not a business. Uh, what happened was some of the guys from EAH at 292 came to me and they said, we'd like to build some reproductions of your work bike. And I knew them, and I knew they were real, and I knew they did wonderful work. And so I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll cooperate with you. I'll let you come you know, measure. I'll finish it. And I, a few drawings exist, and there's no plans. And so there's a lot of engineering work to be done to reproduce it. I the first engineering. And Bob Engel is the lead builder on the There's a really thing to be a builder itself, so, although I don't know what the other guys are going So, you know, Bob builds it. When it's done, it's Bob's airplane. And beyond that, who knows? You know, I'll just be told I'll see how the fans will go again. All right, well, thank you guys. Good fun.